I mentioned in the beginning about the importance of templates, developmental templates, and you've got tons of them. We've got Freud's psychosexual stages, right? We've got Erickson's psychosocial stages. You've got Piaget's cognitive stages. All of them are very, very helpful in terms of looking at the way a client or a family is progressing and developing. Very, very helpful. What I want to do um, in the conversation today is to add some other templates into the mix. I trained with Virginia Satir. Yes, on an island, if you can believe it. Gabriel Island, which was... It's an island just off of Vancouver, kind of in that mix. Um, it's not really Puget Sound, but it's in there. And this was back in the day. I worked at a hospital in Erie, St. Vincent's, when there was money for continuing education. For heaven's sakes, I don't think anybody would be able to go do something like that today. But they, the opportunity came up, and I presented it to my supervisor. And of course, they wouldn't pay for all of it, but they said, hey, we'll pay for half. So I went and spent two weeks on an island with Virginia Satir and probably about 25 or 30 other, I don't know if they were clients or therapists. Let's put it that way. Um, Virginia didn't really differentiate between them. And she, I think, kind of viewed everybody as a client. Um, but it was her way of kind of teaching and training. So the lecturette that I want to present to you is based on the lecture material that she gave there that I found extremely useful when uh, people present to me with different issues. People come in, they're usually in crisis, maybe not um, uh, extreme crisis, but there's something really distressing that's going on when they present in that initial session. Um, so. This is um, the stages of change. I don't know how familiar you are with Gregory Bateson. Um, Gregory Bateson talks about the epistemological lens. Epistemology is the study of knowing, and the idea here is how do we take what we perceive and give meaning to it? And then the argument is, is that as you layer experience into who you are, you begin to develop a particular framework. Piaget would have called it a schema. But you begin to give meaning in ways that are predictable. And you develop um, a particular way of seeing things. Now granted, it may vary based on the perception that you're having. Um, but the argument here is that that would be um, an epistemological lens. Virginia referred to um, this first <coughs> stage in her model as the status quo. That is, what is now? Everything is just kind of steady state. It has its equilibrium, or it's, uh, uh, it's in some sort of homeostasis at the moment, right? And we can talk about this model cognitively. You can talk about it relationally. Um, you can talk about it probably even on a macro level. But the first stage, the status quo, that's the framework that we give to what is now, right? I mean, each one of you got up this morning. You have your own little routine, your own little thing that you do in terms of starting your day and moving through your day, right? I mean, I don't know about you, I get up, I grind my, I actually had a tough time this morning. I, I made some mistakes and I ruined a, a wonderful good pot of coffee. I ended up with grounds in it and had to throw it out and was, oh. But that's part of my routine in the morning is to make the coffee, right? Fill the cat dish with water. You have this little routine that you just kind of go through. It's, it's what is now. And if there are things that are um, out of the ordinary, you know, you deal with them, but you still have that uh, frame of reference that you work from. Think about the frame of reference that you have with the relationships in your life. You either have a positive sense about where things are or a strugglesome sense. I don't even know if that's a word, strugglesome. But 
you know, however it is, it is. And you make predictions accordingly. The second stage is what Virginia refers to as the introduction of a foreign element. Now, this is where you, you want to include a little bit of Piaget in here and that notion of schema. You remember assimilation and accommodation? Assimilation says that we take what our experience is and fit it into the existing schema. Accommodation says we have to create a new schema because it no longer fits. This introduction of a foreign element can be anything, but you're, you're forced into that quandary about whether or not it can be fit in the existing situation, like uh, me with the coffee pot this morning. I didn't have to really change that, I just had to clean it up. I cleaned it up, got a new filter, put the right thing in that needed to be in there, and we were good to go. Could keep the same schema, just assimilate the crisis or the introduction of the foreign element into the, the process. But in terms of changes that come, in many instances, you've got to create a new schema. You've got to do the accommodation process. So let's say that baby comes, right? Or let's, let's start at the beginning. You get married, or you make that commitment to get married, or whatever that is that you're doing and you're together that first year under the same roof, hopefully, uh, it requires some major adjustments to, to get into the ebb and flow of having the presence of another person in your space, in your face, in your sock drawer. I mean, they're there, and they're not going anywhere, right? Separate and apart from our distance regulation that we spoke about. Uh, it requires adjustments. And you are trying to think about, okay, this is different. I knew that being in a committed relationship was gonna have lots of benefits, lots of pluses in terms of this, you know, person I'm gonna be able to confide in and have a friendship with and have fun with and do things with. But I also have to deal with the fact that they get into my stuff and they're in my space. And some of you ladies may, I mean, I remember the first fight I had with my wife. We're six months into the relationship. I had three piles of clothes on the floor in the bedroom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, eh, eh. She said, I didn't marry a kid. So I don't know what you want to do with them, but you either hang them up or you put them in the hamper, yes. but we're done with this. <laughs> She says, I put up for six months waiting for you to get the wake-up call. Yes. And I'm like, okay, all right. Well, there was definitely a foreign <laughs> element introduced into my world at that moment, right? And um, she was right. I didn't really have a defense. She was correct about that. But I, you know, me, like a lot of other guys, we were raised to be slobs. It was terrible to say, but it's true. And many of you mothers out there helped us quite a bit because we never really learned whatever that skill was we were supposed to get. Now, I've got it now. You can be darn sure after 40 years of marriage, I know where the socks go, I know where the underwear go, I know where everything goes. Um, but it, was, it felt like a, a foreign element. And I'm using this as kind of a thing to joke about. But you can imagine larger issues that come into play, right? Um, here, here's an example of one when the baby comes. Everybody's excited. Everything's wonderful. We got a healthy baby. The baby's no complications, right? Maybe little John just had to go through the little, whatever that thing was with the heat. And everything's good. Baby comes home, everything's good. I thought everything was good. But now we gotta work out the feeding arrangements. And in the beginning, you're just kind of doing it on the fly. And then all of a sudden, mom wakes up and says, what the hell are you doing having a good night's sleep? I'm not getting any sleep at all. I think you need to get up in the middle of the night to do the you know, 
middle of the night feeding. And, uh, and in the beginning, we would do the elbows back and forth, laying there. Right, oh, it's your turn to get up. No, Chuck, damn it, I got up last time. You get up now. Right? You, I mean, and you guys are smiling at me, so I know I'm not that far off. Uh, but it's a, it's a bit of a foreign element, that baby, as welcomed as they are into your world, you've got to deal with the fact that you've got all these other levels of growth and adjustment uh, to make. Now, let's look at things um, that are not so pleasant. Let's talk about uh, a divorce. Uh, let's talk about death. Um, let's talk about uh, job loss, significant job loss. Um, things that you're, you're not expecting. We all have kind of created a framework in our mind's eye about how things are supposed to flow for us. And when we get hit with things that aren't a part of it, and especially if they're um, uh, really powerfully negative, um, it can really pull, pull your sense of equilibrium right out from under. And let me give you, I'll give you a real good example here. Um, I, I work with a lot of couples where the couples come in and then either they come in because of an affair or an affair they discover it and then we're going through the therapy and all of a sudden it's discovered, right? And this is such a good example because the affair, prior to the affair, the what is now, what I thought we had together, and how the trust flowed, the honesty flowed between us. And then the discovery of the affair shatters the epistemological lens that you had for the meaning that you gave to the relationship. And I'll have people sitting there, and they'll say, and my heart goes out to them, so is everything a lie? Is everything that we had together prior to this a lie? Because if I can't trust you in this instance, how do I know that I experienced who you were in those moments without it having been contaminated by the presence of another? Right? And I'm wording it a little differently so you capture it, but in the, in the moment when it gets expressed, it's just so uh, intense. That becomes the major focal point, is how do we recover from the trust that's been breached? And in most instances, even, I mean, you can put Humpty Dumpty back to together, together to a certain extent, but some of that trust, the innocence is gone. It's gone. It is not going to return in the same kind of way. So you. Think in terms of this and how it impacts that epistemological lens, that frame of reference, the schema, right? and then how, do, how are we going to start to piece it together? Before we get to piecing it together, though, you have to go through this next stage, which is the chaos, where, I mean, you, you've been there on other levels. Um, this also makes me think of working with teenagers. Occasionally, I'll have a family bring a teenager in. There's been a bad breakup with a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And just bad in a sense that the, the person is just not recovering very well from it. They've not had many experiences in love relationships prior to coming in, right? And they had their own picture of what they thought that was going to be. The foreign element is the person says, I no longer want to have this relationship with you. And then here's the chaos, right? And I have these adolescents, this is where, you know, lots of times they're thinking about hurting themselves. Because they've created this schema for how their world was going to be having this love relationship be kind of the center of everything. I mean, you know, adolescents, they're idealists. I mean, they love with a perfect love, and they hate with a perfect hate, but they've got it. Now, they have this happen, and they can't get their head around it. I mean, you can see the distress that goes on, 
as they try to make sense out of what happened. They'll plead with the other person to give them another chance. They'll do things to try to get them back in their life. They'll do crazy things to try to make them jealous just because they want to, they want to assimilate the, the notion of what the relationship is back to that schema. If you only gave me a chance or, or if you only understood how much I love you, you're not going to bail in this instance. And they try to flee the chaos. Americans and Christians in particular, this is going to be my soapbox here for a second, we don't do negative affect or chaos very well. We're given lots of messages that we're being faithless if in fact we experience that stuff. And I'm here to tell you, you're human and you're going to get lumped every once in a while. You're going to experience this in your own lives. And when clients come in who come from a strong faith perspective, you may have to deal with a certain amount of guilt or shame that they have around the fact that they're feeling this. And give yourself permission to pursue that a little and help them to normalize that the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. The Tower of Siloam fell and some people died, and they asked Jesus, so who sinned? He said, nobody. It happens. It happens. Yeah, see, I'm going off on a tangent. I hate that. Oh, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> so, chaos. So you're in there, and you know, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. I lost my mom when she, she was 54, right? I was in my 30s and had to deal with looking ahead and realizing my babies are never going to get to know my mother and she was awesome as much as i might have issues with my dad my mom was the greatest thing and she had her issues too but she was something special i lost a brother-in-law who was like an older brother to me and he died when he was 41 an aneurysm and a massive heart attack then i lost my baby sister I didn't even talk about Tammy, the baby that was born kind of as the surprise. She died at 28, had a, um, uh, uh, oh, I can't even talk about it. Um, she had epileptic seizures. She had a grand mal seizure, wasn't taking her meds quite the way she shouldn't have drawn it in the bathtub. 28, 28. Um, you know, those things happen. They happen. There, there, isn't, there isn't any way to prevent it. You try to make the right choices, the good choices, the healthy choices. But there's lots of variables you just can't control for. <coughs> so give yourself permission and give your clients permission that lots of times this is not poor choices. It just happens. And you want to be there for them. Actually makes me think of a family I worked with in California. There are two teenage daughters died in a fire in their home. They survived, the two teenage daughters died. The grief, the intensity of the grief, and you had to be there. This shattered everything. Everything in terms of what they envisioned for their life and their world. Uh, they no longer had children, right? And that meant mm, a lot of other things not there. So the work in terms of getting beyond the grief was very intense very intense. So I give some of the extreme examples to balance out the little things because the chaos can be like my coffee pot this morning, but it also can be really dramatic. Um, and that's where the presence of another person in this therapy experience or therapeutic experience has a wonderful impact in terms of getting them to the next level. Right? Scripture says uh, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We have this incredible capacity for adapting and taking things that are thrown at us and trying to put them, make sense out of them. We're meaning making machines, if you will. Um, and so in this instance, the, the moment the foreign effect or the foreign element happens, and the chaos takes place, 
um, we begin to have that process activated. What am I going to do with this? How do I make sense out of it? How am I going to go from here? As do I have a life beyond here? Uh, whatever it is that I'm experiencing in that moment. And, and there will be that kind of uh, thought process. And you'll be surprised the number of people that will begin to piece it together. For example, in the, the example I gave about the, um, uh, the affair, the assuming that they are both interested in preserving the relationship and working on it, the person that feels really betrayed will begin to see movement on the part of their partner in terms of making an effort to reestablish real trust. In instances, I'll, I'll encourage that person, you're going to have to be an open book. She needs to be able to have access or he to have access to your cell phone and your computer. And it may feel like to you a breach of privacy, but if you really, this is a measure of good faith. This is your way of saying, I'm an open book. I don't want anybody else but you. This is the way it's going to be. Now, occasionally I'll get somebody that says, I can't do that. If that's really what it is, then we'll just have to end it here. And it's ended. There have been times it's ended. In other instances, the person feels so bad, they'll, they'll say, I will do anything, anything. And so the, the person that's been betrayed begins to feel a little bit of hope. They'll begin to see some future. They'll re, kind of create a new epistemological lens um, that still includes the fact that the breach happened and that maybe they need to be vigilant about what's going on or the relationship. But they're, they're putting together a new epistemological <coughs> lens, a new schema, if you will. Um, and that's all in this practice effect. And the practice effect will, in the beginning, try to assimilate. It doesn't want to create a new schema. I want, I, and I'll have people say, I want my life the way it was before. Before this happened, I want it back. You took it from me. I want it back. Okay. Can't do that. That's, I mean, I'll, I'll empathize with the person and then say, you're asking for something that they can't give you. They, it, I mean, granted, it, it was wrong, but you, you can't get it back. So we've got to create a new uh, schema, a new way to frame this relationship. With the adolescent who has lost the love experience, or has lost this first love or whatever. Um, and granted, grandma's tried to give her that message, right, or him. You know, there's lots of fish in the sea. I mean, there's all those uh, messages that you have to be careful in giving that kind of advice, not to be dismissive of the pain that they're experiencing in the moment. But the, the point here is, what I, I'll do with adolescents is to just sit with them in the pain and let them know it doesn't end here. The fear that many kids get in adolescence is that once the chaos takes hold, that's it. <coughs> this is where my life is going to be. And it terrifies them. It scares them crapless. It really does. Sometimes blended families, when the meshing of the two families together, kids will experience that, uh, that chaos. Um, you know, I, I want our traditions. I don't want to lose our traditions. I don't want to have all these other people here. You know, we have our things that we do on Christmas or Thanksgiving, right? And the parents have to find ways to make sure that their concerns are included. To try to preserve as much of that as you can. But the reality is we're we're moving to a different place, and we want to take you with us. We don't want to leave you behind, right? which kids are usually responsive to. They still may pout and give grief. What kind of meaning are you going to give to your suffering? It's a big, ongoing question with your clients in terms of you helping them to give meaning to what it is that they're going through. Is it something you don't want to lose sight of? And the practice effect is wonderful because typically people do find a way to frame things that save their face, save face and spare their dignity, and they're able to kind of make sense out of it. Doesn't mean it always. I mean, you know, you lose somebody close to you, 
um, the loss, you carry that with you regardless of getting on the other side of the grieving. But you, you still have ways that you frame it uh, that let you move on. The, the question is about how the Satir model relates to death and how our clients cope with, uh, with death. I don't necessarily present this to them. What I do is to use it as a tracking mechanism, um, kind of being aware that, that this is a process that they're going to go through. And there's, there's, I mean, grieving is very individual, a case by case basis. Everybody has their own way to grieve, timeline for grieving. But you can usually kind of keep this in mind. Um, foreign elements, if it's an older person in the family, they're 88, 90 years old, uh, there will be a sense of loss, but it's not going to be as traumatic as it being um, uh, death of a child, death of a spouse, uh, unexpected, even when it's expected, um, if it's a long chronic illness. Um, but this would be more intense. I can give you an example of that as it relates to uh, when my mom passed away. I think it's the first time I ever experienced what I would consider clinical depression. Um, I mean, I for about six months, I, I, and I'm a morning person. I mean, I wake up in the morning, I'm ready to go. I mean, I know I irritate the hell out of those night owls, but uh, I'm a morning person. And with my mom passing, I couldn't pick my head up off the table in the morning. I just, it was like someone reached in and ripped my, my heart out. It was, it, was, it, was, it was intense. And it lasted about six months. When my sister passed away at 28, she was 28, um, it was even that much more intense. When someone had called, my brother called to break the news, I began to wail. I've never wailed in my life. I didn't even know what, I mean, I've heard people wail in a National Geographic special, but I've never wailed, but I was wailing. And it was really intense because it was out of sequence. I expected that my mother would pass before me, not at 54. I did not expect a, a sister 10 years younger than me to pass before me. And in that sense, it was more intense, but it didn't last as long. That's what's fascinating. Only lasted about three months. So the foreign element, of course, in this instance is death. The chaos is, I, I'm not familiar with what this kind of grieving looks like. I've lost grandparents and I've lost older people in the family. You know, things that, even though they're, they're lost, to be expected. But things like this that are out of sequence, sudden and out of sequence. <coughs> and so in this instance, it was, just trying, trying to get my head around it, talking with people that care about me. My, my wife, uh, bless her, just really supported me, you know, loved on me, uh, was there for me. Same with the rest of the family, everybody kind of pulling together, right? And we, we recognized and gave meaning. I mean, this is where it gets interesting. You create your own rituals for giving meaning to these people's lives, um, even though they were cut short. And so you, you try to help your clients do that as well, but you don't want to interrupt the grieving process. The family that I told you about that had the two teenage girls, we spent the first eight or nine months, I mean, I just sitting in this room, and sometimes 40 minutes would go by and no one has said a word, but we'd be sobbing. And I'll tell you what, as a therapist, you're going to sob in there with some of those clients. You've still got to find ways to keep perspective, but you're going to feel some of their intensity of grief and uh, whatever the struggle is. And you know what? My encouragement to you, and I know Virginia would say the same thing, is don't interrupt that. That's part of you being present, a really incredible healing presence in the lives of, of your clients. But, um, but after that eight or nine months, we started the dialogue about what, what does this mean and what does it mean going forward and what do you want to do? Do you, do you want to create a, um, 
scholarship at their high school in their name? Do you want to get involved in fire safety at the local level? You know, do you, do you want to become more active in the lives of your nieces and nephews if, you're, if their parents will permit you? Do you want to volunteer as a big brother or big sister? But you don't want to do that prematurely. Be willing to sit in the shit. It's okay. I'm not going to edit that. It's okay. That, you'd be surprised how powerful that is. And if you look in the scripture, there's all sorts of examples of that. Be willing to sit there. Be willing to be there. It doesn't mean that you're somehow um, colluding with the client to maintain their symptoms. What a bunch of malarkey that is. Right? Okay. Other questions? Do you, do you see how this could be helpful in terms of your work with clients? as a, a, just another template, just another template. And I'll tell you what, uh, what I liked about Virginia, she was always looking to frame things in a universal way. She never wanted to pathologize. You know, she would always have some way to frame what's happening that had a universal element. And this is a really good example of, of how she did that. 